Hey guys, Micah here with ebikeschool.com and today I'm going to show you how to tell if an e-bike battery is good quality simply by inspecting it. Now as you guys know, I don't do sponsored videos on my channel. I don't send you guys to Skillshare or some website building site. Instead, I just give you annoying pitches about my books. Did I mention I wrote some books? Because <laughs> basically I sponsor my own channel. Now my channel has grown large enough recently that I'm starting to get offers from e-bike companies and other companies that want to send me free bikes and things and then pay me to say nice things about them. And I've pushed back against that and I don't really want to do that on my channel because basically you guys don't come here for that. If you wanted to see someone get paid to say nice things about a bike, you'd go to EBR or some of the other channels. You guys come here for the educational content. So that's what I want to keep producing. In this case, this was the first time I saw an opportunity to make something educational. A random Amazon vendor reached out and said they'd send me a battery if I made a video about it. So what I decided is I'm going to make a video inspecting this battery to determine what kind of quality it is. That doesn't mean I'm going to recommend it or not, I haven't really inspected it yet. If it's good, I'll say it's good. If it's not, I'll say it's not. But I want to go through and show you guys the process that I would use to determine what kind of quality a battery is. So let's get to it and open this battery up. Okay, the first good thing I see is that it actually has a UN shipping sticker. So this is shipped by a responsible shipper, it seems like. Sometimes they cheap out and they don't pay for the hazmat shipping. Inside we've got an owner's manual, which is kind of funny. Next we've got our battery here, wrapped up in cling wrap, which keeps it from getting scratched up. The battery wires are isolated here, which is good. You want these to be isolated so you don't risk having a short in the box. I probably would have gone with a little bit longer heat shrink on the positive wire here. Uh, also, I noticed the wire is 12 gauge, which is good. Sometimes these things come with 14 gauge. The 12, wire, or 12 gauge wire is obviously going to be better for higher power. This battery is supposed to be rated at uh, 30 amps of discharge. so. 12 gauge wires would do that. Here is the charger. Already I can tell this is a heavier charger. It's not the cheap lightweight plastic ones. It is sealed. There's no exhaust fan. So it's probably going to be lower power. If we check that out. Yeah, we're looking at two amps here. But this is actually a decent charger. It's on the higher end of the cheap chargers. So I would be perfectly fine with this charger. Oh, these are nice. All right, so these things get mounted underneath the battery when you bolt this thing onto the uh, water bottle bosses. And what these do is they're curved, actually it goes this way. They're curved so that this part goes onto the bike frame and it keeps the battery from rocking a little bit. If you've ever seen sometimes these rock if you don't have these contoured spacers. So that's a nice inclusion. So far things are looking pretty good. Let's get this stuff out of the way here. Now let's start by measuring the voltage on this battery and see what it's shipped at. So this is slightly under half charge, so that's just fine. You want it shipping at about half charge. All right, so what we have here is your basic Halong style battery pack. This one has apparently been white labeled Joyce. Seems to be par for the course for these kind of things. We've got our USB charger on this side, our keyed lock. If we come around to the other side, we'll find we have an XLR charging port and our on off switch. So this is a pretty standard Halong case. Um, but the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open this battery up and look inside. Now because it does have an on off switch, I'm gonna put it in the off position before I open it up. And now I'm gonna attack this thing with a screwdriver. And let's take the cover off this battery. Actually, before I go any further, I'm gonna put some gloves on because I am gonna be getting into the electronics here. Right there we go. So now there's a number of things we can see once we have this opened up. First, let's check out what kind of cells we're working with. They said these are domestic cells, so I won't be surprised that these are not one of the big five, either Sony, Samsung, uh, Sanyo, Panasonic, or LG. So I see FST 18650. So these are your basic generic Chinese cells. Yeah, they even say made in China there. Um, so these are not going to be your best quality cells. If they were, uh, you know, one of the big five, that would be better. I always prefer using Samsung, Sanyo, uh, Sony, Panasonic, or LG cells. The other thing is that you can easily look up the date codes on those to see how old they are, what production batch they were from. The other thing is that I'll have to look up these cells to see what kind of power they're capable of putting out. 
the manufacturer says this is a 30 amp rated battery and if these are in a 4p configuration which it looks like they are then that's going to mean that each one of these is going to need to put out about uh, seven and what, like three quarters ish uh, amps if my math is correct so we'll look up these cells in a moment and see what kind of power they can put out the other thing is yeah it looks like they're um, rated here for 2500 milliamp hours or 2.5 amp hours so assuming four in parallel which is what we have here we're going to be looking at 10 amp hours which is what they advertise all right so i Googled around and I found these cells on Alibaba and I found what is purported to be the cell spec sheet. So if we look here, we see these are the 2.5 amp hour cells, but the most important thing I'm looking for is the discharge current. So if we come over here, we see the max discharge current for our normal 0 to 55 degrees C, which is where everyone lives. We have 3C discharge, which means that at 2.5 amp hours, these cells are rated for a max discharge of 7.5 uh, amps. So if we take 7.5, we multiply it by 4, which is the number of cells, we get our magic number of 30. So because this is marketed as a 30 amp battery, the cells theoretically can provide 30 amps when used in a 4P configuration. However, you never want to push your cells to the absolute limit. Yes, they can do it, but they'll get real freaking hot and they'll be real unhappy. So I would have loved to have seen this battery spec the cells such that they could be used at the sort of like middle or maybe up to like two thirds of their max rating. But instead this battery, if used at the 30 amps that it's rated for, is basically pushing the cells all the way up to their maximum limit. All right, let's check out the BMS here. We have a, what is claimed to be a 13S 30 amp BMS. So the BMS does appear to match what the manufacturer states on the um, Amazon page. What I can see here is that if we take a look at the, uh, this will be the B minus wire. Let's pull this out. So this is a 12 gauge wire, which matches what we have on the output wires from the uh, battery mount itself. So that's good. These are capable of supporting 30 amps. The next thing you'll notice is the C minus wire is smaller. This is probably uh, 16 or 18 gauge, which is fine because this is going to be uh, only pulling two amps when the battery is connected to the charger. But we are looking at silicone wire that is comparable to the power level that this battery is designed for, so that's a good thing. Now, the next thing I wanna do is I wanna peel up this Kapton tape and the fish paper on the outside, and I wanna get a look at what the connections look like here. This fish paper is stuck down with like sticker tape, so you just gotta peel this up. All right, so what do we see now? We see this is definitely a 4P battery. We've got four cells in parallel here, and we should have 13 series, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 13. Um, the connections between the cells, I would have loved to have seen full width, but we're probably appropriate with the amount of nickel we have here in the series connections. The other thing is that there are multiple series connections per cell. Here we've got six connections, no, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, seven connections for four cells, which is great. If you open up a battery and you see just like, you know, one or two connections here between series groups, that would be a red flag immediately. You wanna see at least one connection per cell which we do have, those are the straight lines here, but the crosses here at a 45 degree angle making this truss system means that you just get extra series connections. So that's great. Next I see that we have four spot weld marks per cell. That means there were two uh, instances of spot welding. It also shows me that this was done by hand. It wasn't done by a, like a CNC machine or something. The other way I know that is because the spot weld distances are not uniform. Here you can see they're close together. Here you can see the two welds are farther apart. So this was done by a human. That's totally fine. Doesn't mean it's bad. I would have loved to have seen this done by a machine just because then you know that each weld is at the same load. It's at the same basically procedure every time, but these can be just fine when they're done by hand. Um, I also noticed that the balance wires are uh, soldered onto nickel that is then welded onto the battery. That's great actually. I'd much rather see that than to see the wire basically soldered onto the nickel. The other thing you'll notice is that these uh, balance wires are on smaller pieces of nickel, whereas the main discharge wire is on a larger piece of nickel. Now, here's one other interesting thing that uh, is gonna be important to look at is how is that discharge distributed? In this case, you can see the discharge wire, which is this thick one here, 
is connected at the very end of the parallel group, and that is not ideal. I would have loved to have seen this distributed more. Now they might have multiple levels of nickel here. Let's get a closer look. And you know what, it does look like there are two levels of nickel, so that is good. Uh, at least they didn't take the easy way out, which is just to basically put one of these rows of nickel and then to put the discharge wire on the end. However, even with just two rows at 30 amps, I don't think that's going to be enough to maintain the power level without significant heating on this row. So what that means is that this last row, and specifically these last two cells here, are going to get much hotter because all the power from this cell this cell and this cell have to flow through this same area here before they get to the discharge wire. So if you saw the discharge wire here either coming off of multiple cells or with as many strips of nickel as there are cells here or with just significantly thicker nickel you'd be alright but with what looks like either 0.1 or 0.15 millimeter nickel and only two layers here that's not ideal for a 30 amp battery. So I would have loved to have seen a little thicker nickel here or the discharge distributed. The next thing that I wanna test is whether this is actually 100% nickel or whether this is nickel plated steel because nickel plated steel is cheaper and it's sort of a cop out to get a uh, cheaper constructed battery. That saves the manufacturer money but you end up with a battery that can't support as much power because the nickel plated steel heats up a lot more and is not as conductive as pure nickel. So the best way to test this is if you have a Dremel, you can use a sanding wheel to uh, sort of grind on the nickel, and if it throws sparks, you know you've got steel in there. It's better not to do that while it's on the battery, of course. You wanna take a piece off like a sample. The other way, which isn't as immediate, takes a little longer, but also works very well, is to take a sample off, um, take a grinding wheel from a Dremel, a screwdriver tip, anything, and scratch the surface, and then put it in a cup of salt water. If it starts to rust, you know you've got steel in there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna try and snag a sample from here. All right, now I'm pulling a piece off of the parallel connection here because you could have just a tiny little parallel connection and that would be totally fine. There's very little current flowing along the cell. All of the current is flowing between these series connections. So I'm pulling out a piece here, which will not affect the battery performance at all, but it will give me a piece that I can test to determine if this is pure nickel. All right, so I got my little piece of nickel there, and I'm gonna put that in some salt water. All right, so I've got my nickel in some salt water here. I'm gonna let that sit for a few hours. In the meantime, um, there's only a few other things we can look at sort of superficially here on the battery before I close it back up. I do see that there are the green uh, insulator rings here on the positive terminals, which is good. That prevents the nickel from creating a short circuit over time if it sort of rubs and chafes on the cell's heat shrink. One thing I didn't mention earlier, but I do want to check for, is a uh, external thermal probe on the BMS. So on this side, these wires are for the switch. These wires are for the USB and we have no other wires besides the balance wires coming off. So there's no external temperature probe somewhere in the battery that would cut off discharge if the cells were overheating. It's not strictly necessary, but it's something I would have liked to have seen. It's just an extra safety feature that this BMS does not support. So other than that, I think I've seen all I can see from a visual inspection here. Otherwise, there's good battery wire management. Um, the cells are in cell spacers. Everything else seems to be just fine. I don't notice any places where uh, wires are being unnecessarily pulled or being pinched. I don't see any other just sort of physical problems with this battery. All right, so after about an hour or so, I thought that the nickel was gonna be good because I didn't see any rust forming, but now it's actually been about six hours. I'm gonna bring you in here and we can see that there is obvious rust forming on that little piece of nickel that I pulled off of the parallel weld there. And so this is without a doubt nickel plated steel now. There's just no way this kind of rust would be forming on pure nickel. So that's unfortunate. It just shows that the manufacturer used a cheaper option for producing this battery by using nickel plated steel. And that means that the battery is not capable of supporting the same amount of current or the same power as if it was made with pure nickel. And now I need to go clean this cup before my wife freaks out.
All right, so I've basically seen all there is to see with this battery. I can go ahead and start closing it up. So just to summarize a bit here, from what we've seen, I would call this a moderate quality battery. Okay, the good things are it's got an appropriate number of series welds. It's got good um, thick gauge silicone wiring. Uh, the battery is properly insulated, both for the BMS and for the individual cells. Uh, the construction seems to be good, but there are a few downsides here. For one thing, the nickel strip is actually nickel-plated steel, which is going to be an issue in terms of the power that the battery can output without heating up and basically wasting energy as heat. Um, the cells are not the best quality cells. I would have preferred to see cells from the Big Five, though these are probably all right for lower power situations. And basically the, the battery is just sort of a medium quality, medium power level battery. I would not want to run this thing at 30 amps, so I think to call it a 30 amp battery is a little bit disingenuous. Other than that, the battery seems, you know, pretty okay. So would I use this battery myself? I probably would for a um, non-critical application and for a low power e-bike. You know, if I'm doing something that's like a 250 watt, 350 watt e-bike that uh, I don't mind having a bit of a cheaper battery on, I probably would use this battery. I'm not gonna call it a fire hazard or anything like that because the construction actually does look pretty professional inside. It's just that there were a number of corners cut in terms of quality that could have made this battery go above and beyond. So that's sort of my method for going through inspecting a battery and determining what kind of quality it is. You know, inspecting the cells to see what kind of cells they're using, looking at the quality of construction, the way the welds are done, the type of wiring used, the BMS. All of these things are going to give you an indication of what kind of quality the battery is. So thank you everyone for watching. I hope you found that video helpful. Last but not least, it is time to announce the winner from my last video. And the randomly selected commenter is... Greg H. Wynn. So congratulations, Greg. Let me know which one of my books you'd like. There are DIY lithium batteries, DIY solar power, the ultimate do-it-yourself e-bike guide, or electric motorcycles 2019. Let me know where to send it. And anybody else who wants to win one of my books, all you have to do is put a comment below this video. You can say anything you want and hopefully you'll be the randomly selected commenter at the end of my next video. Thanks for watching everybody, see you next time.